Hey guys, I have a huge favor to ask of you. The UC Riverside Athletics Program is at risk of being shut down very soon, and teams like the Women's Volleyball Program, which Christy Alejo played at, will no longer exist. So I'm asking you to sign the petition linked in the description box to show support for the UCR Athletics Program and to try to keep the women's volleyball team alive. Thanks for your help. What's up, guys? This is Coach Donnie with ElevateYourself.org. Welcome to another episode of The Dig, where we talk about everything from volleyball, training, and life, and dig deeper into the story behind the person. And today's guest is Christy Alejo. Now, you might recognize her from the Adidas shoe review video, and I selected her on purpose to try those shoes, and she's also an Adidas volleyball fan, so she knows a little bit about that. Um, but I've known her for probably over 10 years by now, and uh, you know her story is just something, something that I've wanted to share, and I've observed this story in front of me, and uh, she went from Youth Church Volleyball League, also called CYO in our area, to a division one collegiate player. Uh, I've seen her grow up and evolve as a player since ninth grade, where I also got to work with her at the jump camp and coached her a little bit as an assistant coach on some of her club teams. Uh, she's always stood out as a player uh, with her incredible work ethic, willingness to put her body on the line to get the point, uh, competitive drive, and not letting her height dictate her success as a volleyball player. So she's got the same chip on the shoulder as I do being a short volleyball player. Uh, so before we get into this, let's break the ice with a, uh, a series of quick set questions. All right, you ready to go? Yeah, let's do it. Cool. Uh, favorite volleyball player? Kerry Walsh. Favorite food? Sushi. Favorite music? R&B. Biggest role model? My mom. Favorite non-volleyball hobby? Singing. Favorite book? Harry Potter. Favorite song? That's hard. Uh, I would, I first came to mind X Factor by uh, Lauren Hill. Okay. All right. Um, last one. High school team win or club team win? Club team win. That's interesting. A lot, of, a lot of other people I've, I've interviewed has said high school, so that, I can't wait to hear about that one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, go ahead and introduce yourself, Christy, uh, for the fans who don't know you. Hi, uh, my name is Christy Alejo. I played for the University of California, Riverside. It's a D1 um, volleyball team. I was a DS setter. Yeah. I grew up in the Bay Area, and I currently live here now. Cool. Yeah, she's a local person and shout out to all the Bay Area people who are fans of this, uh, this YouTube channel. So first off, I mean, how did you get into volleyball? Um, I come from a pretty athletic family. I think my brother played a whole bunch of sports. So my parents kind of just threw me in there. Um, I played basketball, volleyball, I swam. Um, I played softball and I kind of just stuck with volleyball because I was kind of decent at it. Um, I started when I was in the third grade and I didn't play competitive club volleyball until I was in the eighth grade. Um, and I didn't even know what club volleyball was until like right before my mom signed me up. I didn't even send myself up. She was like, you're playing, uh, have fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's how I started. And where did you go to your elementary school, middle school, high school, just so uh, people get to know a little more about your background? I actually went to private Catholic school all my life up until college. So I went to Our Lady of Guadalupe School in Fremont, 
Then I went to Moreau Catholic High School in Hayward. It's a very small community. I, my graduating class had less than 200. So the volleyball spectrum was very small. Indeed. And uh, for those who don't know Moreau Catholic High School, I think they're a division, are they division three or division two? I think when, division three. I, when I was playing, it was division three. Okay. And I don't know what it is now, but I think it's the same because our school size didn't really change. Yes. And uh, for those who don't know how uh, divisions are determined, majority of the time, uh, a school is ranked by division based on school population. And so in general, the larger the school, the better the teams, but usually some of the more competitive teams are in the division two, II, division three range, because those are some of the, the private Catholic schools that tend to be a little bit more competitive. Uh, so at what point in your volleyball career, knowing that you've been playing since what, fourth grade, you said in CYO? Third grade. Third grade. Uh, when did you actually start taking your volleyball career seriously, like putting conscious effort into your, your training and your goals? I think, I mean, every girl who wants to play volleyball obviously wants to um, make the varsity team their first year. Um, and that was one of my goals coming into high school. And when I started going to the open gyms before my freshman year, I was shocked because girls could like actually hit the ball because when I was in eighth grade, it was, it was a uh, more miss serve, miss serve, sometimes bump set spike, but that was kind of a surprise and you would get super excited. Um, so when I actually saw like rallies happening and girls jumping and diving for the ball, that's when I started to go to a whole bunch of summer camps. I, I think my very, very first camp was the Stanford volleyball camp overnight. Um, and that's where I fell in love, I think, mm. because I was surrounded by a whole bunch of girls who just loved volleyball and going to an all day, all night camp um, kind of solidified that the fact that I wanted to focus on volleyball and just volleyball. So I quit all my other sports um, entering my freshman year of high school um which was kind of big because i was a big swimmer before i went into high school so making that choice was hard yeah. but i definitely wasn't as strong as a swimmer as i was a volleyball player so yeah yeah and i think a lot of us have those moments that click inside of us and uh, for you, it was the overnight Stanford volleyball camp, being immersed in a, an atmosphere where like-minded people, because I wonder if you were the exception on the team where you were the one that was more interested on a lot of your, your CYO teams. Every, every time, <laughs> every team, it's even sometimes in club, uh, especially because I come from the East Bay and there's not a lot, at the time there weren't a lot of competitive girls teams. Yeah. Um, and other girls would be doing other high school sports at the same time. So sometimes they would miss tournaments and practices, but um, I never did. And my parents actually came to every <laughs> practice too. So they were just as invested as I was. Yeah. And I've gotten to know uh, Christy's parents and they're very competitive people. And I think that's where she gets that drive. But I love it when parent and the, the, it, the cool thing was they were never helicopter parents. I think they really let you fail at your own experiences. But we're always there to support and also there to, to kind of kick you in the butt sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Those car ride home, they would be positive, but definitely like, you suck today. And I'm like, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. And we do have, you know, some volleyball parents listening and you know, I don't have any kids. Chris doesn't have any kids, but I've seen a lot of kids grow up. I've seen such a variety of, of parenting styles and the risks that we run nowadays in terms of how we're raising our kids and being a volleyball coach and a teacher, I, I feel like I'm contributing to raising the kids is that we run the risk of not letting our kids figure things out right we want we don't want them to go through the harmful experiences that we grew up with and i think we often think of protective parents as just shielding them from physical safety but you know one thing i think uh christy's parents did such a good job with is they didn't when she was on the floor 
you know, being bruised up when she had tough losses and we talked afterwards, they never really babied her and say, Oh, it's okay, honey. They're just like, well, you know, you just got to do better next time. Or, you know, just, just keep fighting, just keep pushing. Um, you know, they, they didn't rob her of those, those failures that led to so many of her successes. They were very, very brutally honest. <laughs> yeah. And, and loving at the same time. So, you know, sometimes love is hard, but then, you know, that, that's, that's true love. Uh, so in transitioning into high school, you played your first year of club in eighth grade. Uh, tell us about your, your club journey. And then after that, maybe you can tell us about your high school journey, kind of just to see what that was like when your, your first club experience and the next in the, into the next one after that. Okay. Um, so I didn't know what club I wanted to play for. I, I, I think my very first year, um, after my eighth grade year, I tried out for every club possible, MVBC, 650, N-Line, which I eventually played for, um, Nets, Newark Nets at the time. Um, but there was one senior my freshman year her name is Jade Santos, that played for a specific coach, Dan Kwan, for N-Line, that her experience and her level of play um, made me really want to play for him. Uh, and he was coaching a 16s team at the time, and I was only 14, so I eventually played up. But she was kind of my senior role model as a freshman, so... I wanted to play the same team and for the same coach that she did. Um, so I think I went to one open gym for N-Line, not even at Fremont. I think it was in at Gunn High School where one of the directors had previously coached. Um, and it was random. I'd never even heard of it. And I think I, I think I did good because the director came up to me and was like, you should try out for uh, the Fremont team. And I was like, I didn't know what, I was like, sure, okay, I'll be there. Um, and at the time, I think I, there were some club tryouts that happened on the same day. So I was exhausted and end lines was at night. And I thought I had a horrible tryout, but coach Dan came up to me and was like, uh, we're, I'm very interested in you playing for the team. <laughs> I was shocked. And I was also a little starstruck because I was like, oh, my God, this is Jade Santos's coach. <laughs> oh, God. I, I uh, had a previously had an offer from a different club that I was thinking about choosing. But once Coach Dan came up to me, it was, it was lights out. I was like, yes, I'll, I'll play for you. And. I actually played for N-Line for the rest of my high school experience and Coach Dan was um, my coach for all four years and a very vital part of my volleyball career. Mm. Yeah, and I'm gonna add something to, to Coach Dan Kwan, the legend. He's actually also my coach and mentor, uh, someone who took me under his wing as a player. He's four years older than me. Um, and also I, I studied a lot under him as an assistant uh, for the high school that he coached that and then coached with him at n -Lime. So he, he's definitely a, a, such a, a big role model for a lot of people in our area. So I'm, I'm really glad that you had a chance to, to, to play under him for the time that he was here because he's gone now. Yeah. <laughs> he's in SoCal. He left. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we do have some youth club girls volleyball players listening to you. So what advice would you give to them if you could walk them of how you made your decisions on choosing a club team? Because I think your senior year, you, you kind of branched out just to see what else is out there. Right? I, the City Beach and Vision. I, um, I think I was very bought into the kind of, what's it called? Their, just the name brand because a lot of the girls who played for Vision, played for um, City Beach, went to D1 schools. And so I was very drawn in um, by that aspect because I, my dream was to play Division I volleyball since that Stanford camp, and I watched those girls play. Um, so 
I wasn't getting very much looks, very many looks in my sophomore and junior year, which is when a lot of girls are getting recruited. So I started to look at other clubs um, and I made City Beach, I think I made the ones team and I made the Visions 18 twos team. Um, so I was very torn by finishing my four years with Coach Dan or trying something new with girls I've never played with before or a coach that doesn't know me or I don't know him and I don't know his coaching style or if I would like it. Um, but in the end, I, Coach Dan said that he would help me get to play college volleyball. And that's something that he did. Um, I was lucky enough to um, coach Eric Balelos, who is the assistant volleyball coach at UCR, is actually from the Bay Area as well, and played with Coach Dan um, back in the heyday. I don't know when it was, but a long time ago. BC. Uh, <laughs> um, I was lucky enough that he came to watch some of our games my 18th year and then the head coach coach Michelle Patton Coleman Coleman um, came to watch me play as well so I think it works out that I stayed and it also helps that it was a smaller club and I um, not the star but I um, was a vital role of the team so I stood out more than if I were to play at a um, a bigger club like Vision and City Beach. Yeah, you touched upon something that's really important for people to realize is it's easy to be blinded by name brand, right? And that goes for everything from clothing to restaurants. I mean, you really have to choose what's gonna be best for your journey and not what's gonna look good to other people. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think it's no, no surprise that he guided you on that journey to play college volleyball and another thing we could take from that is communicate your, your goals to your coaches. Because I bet if you never told him, he just like, oh, she just wants to play competitive club. I'll, I'll, you know, that's, that's it. But the fact that you had a conversation with him was, was really critical. I was also very lucky because he uh, helps his job is he works for, he worked for like a college recruiting something for, mm -hmm. for school, not for volleyball. Um, but he, Help me really along the way. So I yeah. was very lucky to have him. So you, you've walked us through your, your club experience and, and gave us some advice of how to choose um, a club. Now let's talk about your high school experience. So playing for your high school team and, you know, what challenges did you experience along the way and what tough decisions did you have to make along your high school journey? I have to like remember my high school experience, but my first year, I actually made varsity my very first year. Um, and there were only three of us who made the team. But halfway into preseason, I get this call from my coach saying that she's going to drop me down to JV. And that was the most devastating call that you could. I was 14. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> what just happened like was I not good enough but in retro retrospect I think that was probably one of the best best calls I guess at the time I was I was crying my heart out but um I wouldn't have played for endline I don't think if that wouldn't have happened mm. because that drove me to what I did I was that the same year that i did jump camp? No. You did, I think you did two years in, when you were 15 and 16. So that was the next year. Um, but I worked harder. I played harder. Um, yeah, I, that, was, that was one of the most devastating calls of my life, but worked out for the best. I still love you, Coach Amy. Um, and after, I don't really remember my freshman year, honestly, but <laughs> sophomore year, um, you don't hear a lot about sophomore um, captains, but the senior, she was a lone senior. She actually chose me because she said that she really appreciated my work ethic. 
Mm -hmm. um, and that that's something that the team could learn from. And so she chose me to be a captain. I had no idea what that entailed. I was still an underclassman trying to not boss around, but to tell upperclassmen what to do. And like they, at first they didn't listen. Um, and that was a very large learning curve for me. Um, we didn't do very well. Every year that we made, made it to NCS, we lost to our rival, Bishop O'Dowd, every time. Mm. Um, junior year, no, I'm sorry. I, don't rem I really don't remember my junior year either. That's okay. But the one thing that I do remember from my senior year for sure was my senior night. That was one of the first times I asked Coach Dan to watch my high school game. And uh, we lost in three at home to Mission San Jose High School, a.k.a. Coach Donnie. Uh, one of my best friends who I played with for all four years of my club experience, Vicki Peterson, um, she was on the other side. Um, and I don't think she played that game. I think she had a concussion. She, she played that game. It was the game before. There was one game that she didn't play. I, I think that might have been the junior year, but I remember the two times we played you guys when we went to five at home. Yeah, she played. So the concussion, I think, was from the previous year. Oh. Well, anyways, we lost in three at home on my senior night. Um, and nice. so I was like, I'm never inviting Coach Dan to any of my high school games. <laughs> Because the next game that he watched was our game against Bishop O'Dell. <laughs> and we lost in three again. I was like, this is not happening. Oh, uh, man. But I think my high school experience forced me to, to be a better leader. Um, because a lot of the girls weren't as driven I don't think, especially in, like in club, obviously people choose to pay and like travel when you're on that team. But in high school, a lot of the girls just want to play with their friends. Yeah. Um, and it really pushed me to push other girls in practice, mm -hmm. not just my play, but with my words, because I'm not a very vocal player when it comes to direction. And I'm not very confident in my words, so I use my actions. But um, that really helped me grow as a person, I think. And it allowed me to mentor freshmen at the time. There was one freshman on our varsity team who was like a little baby, and she like didn't know what to do. Um, so that that was kind of fun because that was like something that um I wouldn't I didn't think I would do as a freshman looking up that makes sense yeah yeah that's great yeah you, you, you guys... that was a whole that was a whole mess of my story because <laughs> very choppy and I can't really remember details other than that senior night very yeah. traumatizing <laughs> couldn't hit anything couldn't pass anything and we did have a, a specific serving game plan. We actually, um, I don't know if Vicky will remember this, but we had, well, we knew what plays you guys were going to run, like the, the back one, front one. We ran the same thing. <laughs> I don't know why anyone else didn't figure it out. Ran the back one, four. That's right. And then when you were in, a, when you were passing left front, we would serve the, the five, six seam to make you pass inside and have to work really hard to get outside to get you know get you caught in these awkward positions so uh it was uh it was good to see that player wow. <laughs> there is also one other game that i remember actually just one specific part of a game that i remember mm -hmm. um dan yang i'm sure people fans know who dan yang is yep. um he coached for kennedy for a few years and he was also one of the assistants for N-Line at the time. Um, and I went on a serving run on him. And then he called a timeout and stared at me. <laughs> and then 
once we got back from the timeout, I missed my serve. And I just looked at him and I was like, <laughs> I was trying not to miss my serve because I know that's why he called it. And then yeah. I did it. I, oh. I don't even, I'm pretty sure we won, but at that specific <laughs> moment in time, because I didn't want to give him the satisfaction. Yeah. But I did. I missed. <laughs> Choked. Uh, Yang's uh, Yang's head, head games. He gets that from Dan Kwan too. Got to play mental games. <laughs> so uh, thanks for sharing about your high school experience. Uh, now we can let's talk about how you ended up deciding to play in college because I know you got recruited by a couple schools. Um, how you reached out to them, and then also how you got connected because your your journey is kind of interesting going from the the programs that you went to. My parents really wanted me to play in college too, um, just because they just didn't want to stop watching because they are the type, like I said, they went to every practice. I don't think they missed a tournament um, in my club experience either. Um, but they really gave me the reins on choosing. And um, they were like, I don't care where you go. I just want to watch you play. And that was something I kind of wanted to give back to them. Like I just wanted to play so they can watch me for another four years, mm -hmm. but it was tough. I got a lot of no's. I emailed like all the colleges in California. Um, there were some um, colleges in like the East coast, but I didn't want to go that far and it's cold, but I had to do all of my video editing all my highlight reels and it's it's tough to go through hours and hours of video yep. to find one hit that is kind of decent um passing and pretty my highlight reel is still up and it's way too long i think it's like 10 minutes <laughs> um i am not a big blocker i was bless you i was trying to get um, recruited as a setter hitter but I'm only 5'8 and trying to play D1 volleyball is very hard when my vertical isn't as good and um, my setting was decent so I had to try and get recruited as like a passing hitter and um, it was very hard to do that as well like finding clips um, of myself so I kind of I was just like I'm gonna put a whole bunch of highlights in here and hope you get distracted by that <laughs> um, but when um, coach Eric actually found more interest in me I had to ask some of my club coaches coach Kevin um, Junior and Yang they actually helped me film at mission um, just very uh can't think of the word isolated clips of me passing and digging and when it came to those clips like I couldn't hide it was just they wanted to see me rep it out and see what I do and um, that was very tough as well because I was trying not to mess up because they didn't want me to cut anything too so that's interesting. So they wanted a raw clip. So even though you did control the environment, they just wanted raw to successive reps. Yeah. I was like, coach Kevin, don't, you got to make it look like it's hard, <laughs> too hard. Cause I'm still trying to look good. <laughs> oh man. That's funny. But he has a crazy float too. So yeah, he's got the, one of the, sh the most accurate down balls, but also the toughest floats. Yeah. That's funny. Um, so you, I know you originally got recruited by SF State, which was a division, Salt, very good Division Two school. So how did you get recruited there? And then I know there was another change after that. It it actually wasn't SF State; it was Dominican, Dominican University. Okay. They're in the same conference, but um, I reached out to Dominican because one, they were a good school, and because I wanted to be a nurse. I still want to be a nurse, but. Um, they were D2, and I thought that I could still um, play at a high level, go to school, um, and be kind of close to home because Dominican is in San Rafael, which is like 45 minutes from my house. Mm -hmm. um, and originally, uh, the coach at the time came to, 
was actually interested and came to watch one of my club games, but I saw her in the corner of my eye. Sucked. Coach Dan took me out. And I, <laughs> I was like, this is my one chance and you took me out. But I, I was doing really, really bad. Um, but Coach Dan actually emailed her and was like, she usually isn't this bad, I swear. Um, and she, gave, she actually gave me another chance. So I just sent her a highlight video um, and she said she would think about it. But in that time that she was still pondering whether or not to take me on the team, I would have been a right side setter, I think. Um, Coach Eric was like, I think um, we're pretty interested in you and we need an answer right away. So when we went to um, the LA, the SCBA tournament, um, he said, right after you're done, come and visit the campus. Let me know what you think. Um, and I love the campus. I love the environment. And it felt kind of like Moreau mm -hmm. because of the diversity at the campus on the university. Um, so I felt at home and I love the coaching staff. I love the practice and I committed pretty much right there and then. And I don't regret it. So Other nice. than the fact that they didn't have nursing, which was really, really sad for me, but I wanted to play at the highest level that I could. So they, so let me clarify. So you went first, got recruited to try to play at Dominican mm -hmm. with Eric and that's coach Michelle, right? No, they're, they're at UCR. Okay. So when you Dominican came first and then coach Michelle and coach Eric came after the like mid me trying to get um, recruited. Uh, okay. So you were deciding between your, you had your eyes set on, you know, playing division two, that's a separate coach. And then as you're thinking about that, Michelle and Eric reached out to you and say, come play for us at UCR. And that's yeah. where you had a good experience or at least a, a good first impression. <laughs> yes. where, where did I get SF state from? Is it because that was Michelle's former school? School. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. That's what I thought was SF state because Dominican's a, a D2 school, right? Yes. Okay. I just think it's funny because every time coach Eric would watch me play, I would play amazing and we would win and yada, yada, yada. But once coach Michelle came to watch me play tanked every time. Nice. And so when I actually got recruited and I talked to coach Michelle, she was like, I just didn't believe Eric when he said that <laughs> player. Uh, so we kind of <laughs> went on a limb for you. And I was like, Coach Eric, you're the one. He probably just said, like, you know, if you don't take her, I'm going to grow 10 more gray hairs if you <laughs> don't take her, dude. Don't do this to me. <laughs> All right, so now you're at UC Riverside, which is in Southern California, playing Division One for a pretty good, like a decent program. Uh, so if you could share a little bit about your experience being a UCR athlete, um, both just in the athletics program, but also you're specifically being a collegiate player and like your journey from where you started and how you ended up. Um, so I was, I was actually very used to playing obviously. Um, and then you go to a division one program where everyone was a star. Everyone was playing all the time and you're one of the shorter girls coming from a smaller high school, a smaller club that's not really well known, um, to no playing time at all. Mm -hmm. I remember my very first um, practice. It wasn't really a practice. It was conditioning. We were doing conditioning tests that we do when you first get to campus, um, then right before you leave for a break, and then when you come back from break, just to make sure that you're in shape. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I almost threw up. Nice. <laughs> I, <laughs> I didn't, but I almost did. Um, they sent us 
workouts over the summer and I did them. But once you get there, there's like a different level of athleticism and competitiveness and those girls really just like were on a whole different level that I wasn't ready for. Mm -hmm. Um, And we were at the bottom of the conference. So just imagine us versus the top of the conference, which was Hawaii, Cal Poly, Long Beach, um, and what they were doing. Um, So I actually got recruited as a DS setter my freshman year. I wish I could hit, but I did not. Um, But the speed of the game was, is so fast. Floaters coming at your face and just dropping out of nowhere. Top spin serves that die out of nowhere. And these are things that I didn't see in high school or in clubs. So I, I was not ready. Um, they teach a different system that I'm not used to, that I wasn't used to. So it took me forever to get that down. And I didn't see the court for a large majority of my freshman year. So that that kind of pushed me to um, focus on other parts of my game that I knew that would get me on the court, which was serving. Uh, I became like a server, a serving specialist for one of the middles. Um, and that was my way of seeing the court my freshman year. I knew that if I could serve spots consistently, tough, serve some aces and play a little defense that um, I would get my chance, mm-hmm. and, which I did. And that was my role and I had to embrace it, even though I was so accustomed to playing the whole time. Um, It was tough for me mentally, especially like when my parents would come watch me play and they would just come to watch me play and serve a few points and maybe end one rally, but that's it. Um, And I think that's what drove me the most um actually there was one game that I actually got to set my freshman year and it was against Hawaii and I was a third string setter at the time um and it was against Hawaii and the first setter just wasn't following the game plan second setter tanked and my coach looked back and was like Christy you're going in and I was I hadn't I didn't get as many setting reps as them. I was getting a lot of passing reps at the time. So I was like, all right, it's on ESPN. It's on TV. Hell yeah, (laughs) go out there. Um, My first set, I think, was a back set to one of our middles, and it was a kill. Oh, nice. I pushed. I I never jump set. Um, But it was a jump set to the outside kill. Uh, third set, back set to our right side, kill. And then I got taken out. I was like, oh, what's going on here? But I, <laughs> I think Michelle just wanted to talk to um, the setter yeah. and put her back in. Yeah. Uh, but that was a great experience for me. I'll never forget it. Three mm-hmm. assists with three attempts. I was like, this is my chance. Uh-huh. Um, my sophomore year, my junior year, I... Um, started to become more of a right side passer digger. I definitely wasn't as strong as a passer that I was a digger. Um, but my, I watched a lot, a lot of film. Um, and that was something I never heard of before either. Mm-hmm. Um, and that really pushed me, I think, seeing myself and my mistakes because your coaches can tell you a bunch of times that you're not doing something correctly and you're like yes I am and then you watch film and you're not doing it at all I think after every film session that I watched I always watched it with the defensive coach she was like the next practice you got it right away and I was like okay so I just continued watching more and more film really studying what I was doing um 
and that helped me see more court time as well. And another thing that I learned from playing was goal setting, which was goal setting and visualization. I think visualizing digging a ball, visualizing serving aces really helps with your mental game and the positivity that you tell yourself. If you see yourself doing it, then you're going to go do it. Mm -hmm. Um, But goal setting, really working towards the little things um, made me more mindful and made my practices more meaningful every day. Um, at, at the time, I thought it was a chore because we got our goals checked pretty much to make sure that we're doing them. Um, and I thought it was a chore at first because I was like, I don't need homework for volleyball now. But it didn't really click until I started to see changes and that really motivated me to take my goals more seriously um, and um, really advocate for myself, I think. And that's when I started to think more positively because in the beginning it was really, really rough. And then towards the end of your career, you became a main part of the lineup, right? As a right back and serving specialist. Mm -hmm. Right back was my jam. You have to have a different type of mentality when you play right back, especially because the outside hitter, that's, that's their money shot, like hitting down the line. So you have to have no fear. Mm -hmm. Um, And I loved, I love digging people's line shots. That's like my favorite, like taking away their, um, taking away their power. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And the setter dump, it's all yours. (laughs) But serving and playing right back was my favorite part of college, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a, a really cool evolution to watch over four years, how you started off you know, staying on the, on the bench and trying to figure out what the heck this level is and then creeping in your way, creeping your way into the lineup, essentially. And, and I think really having to figure out what role I played best for the team. Yeah. It wasn't hitting, it wasn't setting, but it was digging. Yeah. Digging and serving. Yeah. And that takes a lot of humility and, and honesty with yourself because you have two choices, right? You can, I'm sure you love to hit, right? Is that still one of your favorite skills? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> getting getting a six pack on someone or hitting it straight down is the best feeling ever. But also getting diming someone who's trying their hardest to hit the ball is just is right there. Yeah. And then above that, would you say just getting playing time is <laughs> the, the best? Yeah. Seeing the court and playing against some of the best talent out like the big west conference is a pretty is the top 10 i think in all the conferences Mm -hmm. for the ncaa so the fact that i was able to play against some amazing all americans was life-changing yeah and when you first were recruited ucr were you recruited as a walk-on saying like we we don't have scholarship money but we want we want to reserve a spot on the roster for you Yes. That's awesome. um, I actually didn't earn a scholarship until my senior year. There was only one other um, walk-on that had done that before me to get a scholarship, which was Maddie Hubble, which she got, I think, the last two years of her um, college paid for, and she is the all-time digs leader at the school cool now yeah she was she was my role model because she dug everything and I was like if Maddie can dig it I can dig it yeah that's a good mentality and I think a great lesson we can learn from that story uh, for players parents and just people that want to succeed in anything in life is going back to what we talked about like how parenting really shapes your your kids habits and if you give things to your kids, if you don't let them fail, they're never going to want to work hard to earn something. And I think Christy is a, a, such a, a great example of walking on, 
you know, no scholarship, but just having to grind our way through just working, working hard and, and earning it, like truly earning it, not only on a spot on the court, but a scholarship player, which is a, is a rare thing that people can claim, you know, in collegiate volleyball. Uh, so that's just a testament, right? Just let yourself fail and work through it and, and earn the things, you know, don't just, don't just expect things to give, be given to you. So let's talk a little bit about UCR. Um, unfortunately, uh, I'm, I'm friends with, with um, Coach Eric, and he told me that UCR, due to the pandemic and just some different financial situations, that the chancellor, who's the presence, of, who's the, the leader of the school, has con is considering cutting the entire UCR athletics program. So I also want to take time this for you to to share about you know what the ucr athletics program meant to you and what it would mean to so many future athletes that want to play at ucr want to be given that chance to play division one so if you could share a little bit about kind of what's going on right now with ucr athletics when i first heard about it i was shocked i was devastated because ucr gave me so many opportunities not just like a uc degree but Playing volleyball for a Division I school and not just playing volleyball, but learning about myself, what I can handle, um, pushing myself to the limit, my work ethic, uh, my time management, my, <laughs> we used to have a, we, we had a 10 minute rule mm -hmm. um, for the team, which meant being, if Practice was at eight. The nets had to be set up by 740 and we had to be warmed, be warmed up by 750 so that by eight, um, we'd be ready to go for practice. Mm -hmm. And I still do that when it comes to work, um, my workouts, uh, when I play volleyball, like I always incorporate that 10 minute rule and everything. And I, hate being late now because because of that and I think that's a, a great quality to have now yeah. uh, but it also gave me some of my best friends that I know will be at my wedding mm -hmm. not just even at, on the volleyball team but the whole um, athletic community was were so tight-knit that like um, we all still talk now mm -hmm. and Athletics was, was, is, I think, a branch for the university to um, reach out to the community. We did a lot of volunteering with uh, the elementary schools um, around Riverside, and we did a lot of clinics to help kids who wanted to learn how to play volleyball but couldn't learn, whether it was money, whether they're um, schools didn't have a volleyball program, um, but I think it would just be such a loss for the community as well if athletics wasn't a part of the school. Mm -hmm. And I actually teach at Moreau now, and one of my kids who graduated last year is going to UCR, and he wanted to help help manage the team or practice with the team um, just to get the opportunity to, he didn't want to play in college, but he wants to help in any way that he could mm -hmm. and be surrounded by girls um, who play at a high level. So he, it was, he was texting me the other day and he was really, really sad when he heard about um, the fact that they might take away UCR athletics as a whole. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's not just volleyball, but it's the support staff as well. Mm -hmm. I, Sam, who is, was my strength and conditioning coach, um, Kaylee, the, our um, athletic counselor, and all the sports med staff who were pretty much our rocks to help us stay healthy. Um, I, I just think about all of them and how they are such a huge part of athletics as a whole you can't you can't play and be eligible without all of them yeah so, yeah yeah it's very hard it's, to think about 
And for those who've watched my last video about the Stanford men's program getting cut and a bunch of other, 11 other varsity sports at Stanford, I mean, this is unfortunately a growing trend. But I'm going to add a couple stats to the UCR um, accomplishments and really interesting statistics. So 50% of the student population is first generation college students or 57%. So more than half of these students are that first generation uh, graduates. And not to say that won't happen without sports, but sports is such a central part of the, the college experience. And a lot of those students are entering into, into college because of sports, right? Because of athletics and the opportunities it gives them, scholarships, um, the chance to just live out your passion, you know, as you're studying. Uh, it's the number one university in the U.S. for social mobility. So what that means, I mean, that's a pretty crazy statistic. So that means it, your the students that graduate significantly increase the household income for the families that they come from. And I think that goes directly in line with the college graduates. Um, and also, I, I think one of the most important things in terms of athletics too, it, it gives it gives athletes like Christy, because whenever we think of uh, Division One college volleyball, unfortunately, people only think of Stanford, but that's one of hundreds of Division One school teams. And then you have your Division Two, and then Division Three schools. I mean, there's so much great college volleyball out there, but it gave Christy a shot to play at that level. And it's, it dramatically improved her life experience, but also her, her, ability, her skill level. And I think if it weren't for a school like Riverside, um, you know, these opportunities for, I would say, the more typical athletes like Christy and myself to just play there. I mean, it, it really gives us a lot of those opportunities. So this is a sad story, but we can do something about it. So that I've heard on the street that there's a good chance that if we sign this petition and get over 32,000 uh, signatures, which I'll link below for you guys, the chancellor may reconsider uh, reinstating the program. Um, so he just wants, I'm sure he just wants to know whether people really value the athletics program. And that's one way we can show that. So if you guys are supportive of just sports in general and the positive impact it has on the community, because I think you Riverside doesn't have a professional sports team either, right? No. Yeah. So I honestly, I think I heard Riverside is, it's just, it's the crime rates a little up there in the lowest socioeconomic communities. So athletics is just such a positive place where people can come and be part of a community and look forward to something um, in their city. So Riverside, we got to back them up. Uh, so make sure you guys sign that petition if you feel, strong as strongly about this as we do all right down to our last couple questions all right now who were your role models uh, going into college because i'm sure that changed both in high school and then leading to college like who did you look up to to like i want to be like that person or if i want to succeed i have to become like that or adopt that person's characteristics athletically or just in life uh, let's do both um i guess in life uh you asked me in that quick shootout uh question there i guess um mm -hmm. my role model was is um who is my mom um she was diagnosed with cancer my sophomore year of high school um and to this day, you could never tell that she was sick. She would never let you know. She could be suffering and could be in pain, but her work ethic to try and still support our family to come, come out to every game, I can never, can never pay her back for all, all of that. Yeah. And I think that drove me um, athletically too, because I'm like, if my mom can do all of this while she's sick, yeah. I could, I could go work out. I could go do some weights, do some jump classes, do throw my body on the ground and like dig a ball. Um, 
and athletically too, I, that's the one person that I think that pushed themselves to the limit mm -hmm. um, and never let her opponents know that she was suffering. And um, I, it's kind of funny because my senior year, we, for a preseason workout, we had, I don't know if he was a drill sergeant, but he felt like <laughs> a drill sergeant come out and do some team bonding exercises. Um, and he didn't let us do like put our hands on our hips because it was a sign of weakness to the other team that we were tired or that we were giving up. And so um, that was something that I kind of ingrained in my body that I would never let anyone know that I'm <laughs> suffering so they could pick on me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, my mom is my role model for sure. That's awesome. And if you could end us with your, your favorite underdog story, since that is the theme of, of Elevate Yourself. Theme of my life, I think. I always think of my freshman year of high school when I was cut from varsity. Mm -hmm. My coach at the time didn't tell me the reason why, but I found out um, from the assistant coach that the seniors on the team, not, not the one that was my role model, but the other seniors didn't like me and just didn't want to play with me. Um, so that's pretty much why I got cut. Um, and I didn't say that before because I didn't want to throw them under the bus, but that was really what drove me um, to be the player that I am today, I think. Mm. Um, and to me, that's the ultimate underdog story because despite being devastated, despite being not wanting to be on the same team as, um, I still achieved my goal, which was to play Division One volleyball. Um, and I played all four years. I still play today, so I'm still running around. Um, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't change any part of it. That's awesome. Uh, what's even more victorious is that I'm pretty sure they didn't want to play with you due to their own insecurities or their own or, you know, arrogance where they thought you weren't good enough or like, why is this freshman here? And I'm, I'm sure, I don't know who they are, but I'm pretty sure you've exceeded their ability. Yes. Even though, right? Yes. <laughs> I, I have. That. Which is very satisfying for me yeah so. yeah that's awesome that's a great story to end on well thanks christy for being on the show and, and sharing us your 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 journey and and just such an incredible story and and it's 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 a it's a living story i mean this is how you live your life so for those of you guys who get to know her uh you'll probably see her in some future co-ed tournaments that we might play together and try to beat up some taller teams uh, but you hopefully know, this won't be the last time you see her. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem.